all of you here would have heard about uh, assembly line production process. It is a manufacturing process in which a product goes from one station to another and at every station some value gets added to the product or sub some component of the product gets completed and at the end of the assembly line the finished product comes out. A bottle of coke is produced like this, a Tata Nano is produced like this. A lot of things we consume on a day to day basis are actually produced through assembly line production process. But that's not what I'm here to talk about. The interesting question is, have you ever seen an assembly line production process for an individual or a human being? This one that right that exists right here in this room and in our country. And it is something as follows. You get on to something called a DPS. From there you get on to something called a IIT. From there you go to a IIM and then to a MCK and pop up pops out a product of this assembly line production, right? <laughs> so and most of you sitting here in this room today are are in a sense somewhere in this assembly line production process. Most of you. Uh, but it's not exciting to be a bottle of coke. It's not exciting to be a Tata Nano, right? Uh, so with this in mind, I said, okay, let me try and get off this production process and actually try and take the plunge, as we call it. And that's what I did when I started summer grid development. So it's a, as the uh, uh, introducer described, it's a, it's a social enterprise that works at the intersection of politics and development, and Essentially, we partner with elected representatives, MPs, MLAs across six states right now uh, and support them with various aspects of constituency development. But I'll talk about that a bit later. The important point is decided to get off the assembly line production process and take the plunge with the hope, of course, that at some point a, a parachute will come and, and, and the risk would pay off. Right? Since the time I've done that, two and a half years back, there's some, some people, a lot of people who ask the question that what you're doing right now doesn't have any link whatsoever with what the training you've undergone on the last uh, or, or your life, right? You've gone on a complete tangent. You learned something else and you're doing something, something completely different, right? I like to look at it at a very different way. I believe everything that has done, that I've done in my life was in some sense a preparation for what I'm doing right now. And the good thing about this assembly line is also it helps you kind of create convincing answers to these questions and I've tried to create one. So the way I'd like to answer this is that a DPS taught me the, the ability to work hard and to be competitive. IIT gave me the confidence that yes, I can do whatever I want to do and, uh, uh, and I can quickly learn things that I do not know as of now. I am gave me some basic skills around leadership, around team building and so on. McKinsey gave a core skill set which is transferable in any situation and also a lot of exposure in a very compressed period of time. And therefore, if you do A plus B plus C plus D, then you essentially get to, get to what I'm doing right now, which is, which is development entrepreneurship and trying in my own small way to create impact at scale. So that's the way I look at it. So there's no disconnect between what I've been doing all my life and what I'm doing right now. In fact, there's a very natural flow in which things have happened. I'll spend the next 10 minutes talking about three aspects. Uh, one is what we do, then why we do what we do, and the third is how we do what we do. So starting off with the what question. Uh, I decided to kind of get on the internet and, and look for the definition of the word business consulting. What is business consulting? The first link that popped up was a Wikipedia link and, and it defined business consulting in a very holistic manner. It said it's the process of diagnosing, it's, a, it's the process of diagnosing the issues and problems with a, with a business entity and leveraging external expertise to address the same and then went down to list a set of things that can be done or aspects of business consulting like, like operational transformation, strategy inputs, human resource management, technology interventions and so on and so forth. So it's a, I thought it's a very nice and holistic way of defining business consulting. I said let me test Google a bit more. I put in the term political consulting, right? And this is what it had to say. It said that political consulting refers to a newly emerged industry to support political candidates with election election management. That's to me very, very uh, outdated in a way, right? It, this is a definition that would have worked say five years back. It's it's a bit outdated, it's a bit archaic, it's, it's, it doesn't capture the essence of political consulting, it, it's not comprehensive enough. 
right? So I said, okay, let me uh, let me try and define political consulting from my side. And this is, and I strongly believe that it has to be defined in the same way as business consulting. It's a process of diagnosing the problems and issues with a political entity or an individual politician and leveraging external expertise to address them. And like business consulting, there could be various aspects of political consulting. Campaign management is certainly one of them, uh, but this on-ground development, what do you do after you win? Campaign is only till the time that you are, you are supposed to you get into the power. But on-ground development, and of course policy research and formulations and so on. And there will be several more that will emerge with time. Samag operates in the domain of political consulting and within then within that specifically on on ground development as i said in particular we support elected representatives with holistic development or samagra development of their constituencies that's the that's the that's what we do now if you want to understand the political consulting landscape in bit more detail then i would like to the way i like to look at it is the following you move the types of services that you're providing, the potential types of services on one axis. So you have campaign management, on-ground development, policy support and formulation. And then the other axis, you put the various potential clients that you can serve, right? You can either serve a legislator, a MLA, a MP, a, a Zilla Parishad member, a municipal councillor and so on. You can serve a political executive, which is a minister, a cabinet minister, a chief minister, a prime minister for that matter. You can consult political parties. Right? And the intersection of this, so this is a 3 by 3 metric, mat matrix and each cell of this represents one aspect of political consulting. And today, as we are sitting and talking here, there are, there are entities in India in each and every cell of this matrix. So that's the way political consulting has evolved over the last few years. So to say that it is just a recently newly developed industry to support candidates with election management would be probably grossly incorrect. So that's the what part of it. Let's move to the why. why. Why is this important? Why is political consulting important in the first place? And why we are doing this? Again, I decided to draw parallels from the business world. Let's look at a business leader and say, for instance, a CEO of a mid-cap company. Right? What are his responsibilities? He's supposed to manage a, a, maybe a team of, of a few thousand people, employees. He suppose he, he would have a typically a revenues of a few hundred crores, let's say, or a few thousand crores for that matter. Uh, he has to take care of the clients which could be other businesses or which could be the end consumer. He has to make sure that the quality of the product service his company is producing is up to the mark. So that's broadly his responsibilities, right? What are the, what are the things that he has under him to be able to deliver on this expectation or this responsibility? He has at the very least a well established functional office, right? He has a professional support team which he has the ability to fire and hire, right? He has the freedom to leverage ex external expertise whenever he feels something doesn't exist within his system. That's the least that any CEO would have. Now let's, let's now contrast this with a political leader, right? And here we take an instance of a member of parliament, let us say. What are the roles and responsibilities of a member of parliament? Let's say they spend around 100 days in parliament, given parliament is functioning and it, it started functioning off late. So, so 100 days in parliament, right? And there they are supposed to kind of talk on everything from nuclear liability to food security to sanitation and everything. So they're supposed to kind of participate in debates, raise questions, represent the viewpoints of their constituents and, and, and also participate in standing committees where they're members of and deliberate there on lawmaking and so on. So that's the parliamentary part. Once they are in their constituencies, around 250 days in a year, they become like very, very superhuman social animals, right? They have to, they have to attend so many foundation layings, flags off, inaugurations, death ceremonies, marriages, and like it's countless. That's one aspect of what they do when they are in the constituency. It's a significant aspect, by the way. Any grounded politician or MP, at least at that level, would, when he is in, in his constituency, have around 100 to 500 people visiting him every day with, all, with some issue or the other. It could be individual concerns, it could be community issues, and he's supposed to kind of address them. Grievance redressal is a big component of what, they, what they're expected to do. Then add to that the whole responsibility of facilitating development in the area that they come from. There's an expectation of the people. It's not a constitutional mandate, but there's an expectation from the people that you're supposed to kind of develop the region that you are elected from. And then they have political party responsibilities of campaigning and so on. So just think of this. This is the expectation and the responsibilities that an MP uh, the people have from an MP. And what is the empowerment? A minimalistic office, hardly it can be called an office. The provision that they get to run the office is, is probably 
not even sufficient to take care of the monthly tea expenses of their office. Right? Then they have no professional support at all. They have party workers, which are very good in organizing rallies, meetings, and so on, but they don't, they don't have the expertise, the professional skill set, the mindset, the inclination, the drive to develop to do development work or policy work. So in some sense, they have no in-house teams. And then no provision to leverage, leverage external expertise. You don't have anything in-house, but you also don't have a provision through which you can seek external help. So that's the situation in which the ground reality is, contrasting it with the popular perception. Right? The fundamental belief that we have at Samag is that Politics is the biggest instrument of change. If you want to bring about sustainable and change and change at scale, then politics is the instrument for that. It has to sharpen, it has to, it has to become effective. That's the only way we can reach there. And what we try to do is to empower or support well-meaning politicians in bringing about or, or delivering on the mandate that they have. That's primarily what we, uh, uh, what we do. And that's the reason why we, why we believe political consulting is important and that particularly development consulting is very, very important. So that's the why part of it. Let's come, how do we do this? Again, so we've talked about political consulting. We talked of business consulting, political consulting. We've talked about a business leader, a political leader. Now let's, I, I thought we'll continue the same analogy and let's talk about a business entrepreneur to describe how we do what we do. Again, I went to Google. You look at the first few links, it comes a very nice and clean definition of what a business entrepreneur is. And you would know, most of you would know the definition, right? There are three main factors of production, land, labor, capital. And business entrepreneur is somebody who gets together these factors of production, takes the required risk, produces the required product or service, and reaps the benefits or the rewards of it. That's the definition of a business entrepreneur, economics 101, as our professors would tell us, right? Good. Then I said, okay, let's, let's test Google again. I put in the word uh, political entrepreneur, right? In the re recent context and especially in the context of India, what you get out of it is this, right? That's political entrepreneur. So I said, maybe the, maybe the terminology has to change, right? Here in, the, in this section. So I said, okay, let me try something else. Development entrepreneur working in a political domain, right? And that's a better description. Maybe slightly longish, but more precise. There's no definition of this that exists on, on Google or, or anywhere, right? So I said, okay. Continuing with the same analogy, let me try and define what a development entrepreneur working in the political system is and what are, uh, what's the definition of, of this animal, right? So like factors of production, if you look at from a development point of view, I'm not talking about policy here, if you look at from a development point of view, there are factors of development and I define them as the following. There has to be an innovative solution to a problem and a set of people who are willing to implement that. You can call it idea plus labor, uh, but but that's, there has to be, so this, that's one factor of development. This has to exist. Then there has to be funding that has to exist. It can either be government funding, it could be private funded, it could be self-funded, but there has to be a mechanism of funding things. Administrative support becomes very, very important because when you're working in the system, you need government support, you need approvals, you need kind of, you have to penetrate the system and so on. And lastly, mobilization is very important and that's where politics comes into the play. You can, you can actually, you can actually mobilize a whole community towards something positive. We've seen instances of it in the recent past, but that's also very important. And then a development entrepreneur working in the political domain becomes someone who kind of brings these factors of development together and creates the desired impact. That's, that's how I would like to define And This is exactly what we do, and this is exactly how we deliver on the mandates at a constituency level. We are that invisible hand, we are that connecting the dot people who will bring these different factors of production, will identify a problem, identify a solution, identify implementing agency, agency who does this, identify a source of funding, get the government administration, the bureaucracy to align, get, leverage the political powers of an MP to kind of mobilize community towards it, and then make sure something gets delivered, right? So that's, that's how we kind of operate at a constituency level. Now, before I end, let me, let me just make a few predictions, right? I won't go into the reasons for it, but, but based on what I've seen over the last few years, there are certain predictions of, of this domain. The first set of predictions is related to the political consulting landscape, right? My sense is that over the next few years, we'll see an increasing number of entities operating in each cell of this political consulting landscape. There's already some of the other entity in each cell, but that number will increase significantly. Plus, you could also see 
the type of services increase and so the political landscape itself getting, the political consulting landscape itself getting expanded. So that's one thing. Second, increasingly you will see entities collaborating, consolidation happening in this domain and somebody say for example who's working on development and something who's, wor who's working on, on campaigning, joining hands because their client happens to be the same. So a lot of consolidation will happen, people will come together and there will be players operating across different cells of this pol political consulting landscape. And third, which is a very interesting one, my sense is that in a few years from now, we'll see players who get established in this domain, slowly moving and leveraging their skills, tools and expertise to kind of serve clients on the business consulting end. The business dynamics, the revenue dynamics, and the skills that they require will make sure that that transition happen at some point in time. So that's the third. That's one set of predictions. The second prediction is around the plight, so to say, of a political leader. Right? I think sooner or later it has to happen. But at some point in time, the government itself will make a provision through which legislators, MPs, MLAs and, 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 and the sorts could actually hire or leverage the services of high quality professional teams to deliver whatever mandates they have. It happens across the world, it will happen in India sooner rather than later. And the last prediction, and I end with this, and this is the most important of the lot, I think, which is related to the assembly line production process. I think over the next few years, more and more people like you sitting in this room will have the courage and will, will kind of decide to get off the assembly line production process and take that plunge and remove the full stops, question the full stops. All the best for that and thank you.